Hello, I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. Today I'm speaking with Mr. David Hallahan. Mr. Hallahan was a Marine for 21 years, was the former U.S. defense attache to Latvia, and is the owner of Overbrook International in Riga, Latvia. Hello, Mr. Hallahan. Welcome to UATV. Thanks, Alex. Great to be here. Let me ask you, how much of a threat, a security threat, does Russia pose to the Baltic states? Well, uh, abstractly speaking, Russia is obviously a huge country with a massive military, which sits right on the border of the Baltic. So if you disregard what their intentions are, then of course they're a security threat to the Baltics. If you take in consideration the activities of their security services and their military, they are very provocative and very aggressive in their behavior. They conduct unannounced military exercises with no notification to the uh, Latvian government, and they continually interfere in Latvian domestic politics uh, and continually interfere with their intelligence services in Latvia. So, you know, those are all indications that there is a risk whether Russia intends on actually acting on those risks or those uh, capabilities is a different question. Do they, are they involved in cyber warfare in the Baltic states, in Estonia, in Latvia? Uh, that's actually not even uh, a question. I mean, they, there's numerous studies done showing the trolls in St. Petersburg. Uh, they, they own half of the media in uh, Latvia. They, being a member of the Russian Senate, uh, it controls half the media, Russian, Russian language media in Latvia. So they promote a message from the Kremlin via the internet and via uh, open television and printed media as well. Is NATO, are the Baltic state governments doing enough to fight Russian propaganda well, no, the answer is no, but there's a reason, there's a good reason and a bad reason for that. The good reason is that uh, we kind of make it a core principle of our governments that the government shouldn't control information. So it's difficult to fight negative information in the media when you're a Western government, when your policy is that the government itself should not uh, produce media information or, or influence the media information. The, so that's the good reason. Uh, the f weakness in the Baltics, particularly in Latvia, is they do nothing to explain to people or to expose what the Russians do. So instead of countering Russian propaganda, which they probably couldn't do because Russia has a much bigger budget for that and many more people doing it, they should spend a lot more time and effort trying to expose the Russian propaganda to both it, their own domestic audience, but more importantly, to uh, international audiences in Germany, France, Spain, the United States in particular, to explain to people what's going on. I wanna ask you, you were a Marine for 21 years, you know a lot about US foreign policy. How would you grade President Trump's foreign policy, particularly towards Russia? Well, if you understand that President Trump's foreign policy is essentially driven by General Mattis and Secretary Tillerson, I think at the moment, the U.S. foreign policy towards Russia is exactly what it should be, which is uh, openly stating where we disagree with Russia and at the same time leaving um, an extended hand to cooperate with Russia. If you, if you hear <clears throat> what the representative, the Russian representative in the NATO recently said, he said that the Western movements in the Baltics will not be unanswered. And then he said, you know, through our own planning, which if you if you analyze that statement, it's a rather weak statement. He's, he's admitting that we're not going to take any aggressive moves, but we're going to plan to deal with the moves you're making. So the show of strength in the Baltics has resulted in Russia saying, OK, we're not happy about it. We're going to publicly say we're not happy about it, but we're not going to take a countermeasure. So as long as that policy maintains itself uh, and the administration continues on that path, things are fine. President Trump himself is a different different story. He has his own problems with Russia. But luckily for the Baltics, uh, he's not really driving the policy uh, regarding Russia in the Baltic region. He's, he's letting his Secretary of Defense and his Secretary of State drive those policies. I want to ask you, how effective or how good are the Russian spies? We had former CIA Director John Brennan told Congress a few weeks ago that individuals are on a treasonous path 
do not realize they are on that path until it's too late, and that he had grudging respect for Russian intelligence. Yeah, I mean, everyone should. It's a hundred-year-long tradition. They probably the largest industry in Russia, other than uh, weapons and oil, is uh, intelligence services. It's uh, their largest export is espionage. They use it for business purposes. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, Americans uh, are are simply too easy to uh, manipulate and exploit because uh, our security services are so less, far less active in our country. So we don't have this uh, use, this kind of tolerance built up to to be careful when we're dealing with security services. So uh, uh, Russians are very good at many things they do. Unfortunately, they, they oftentimes do them for the wrong reasons. I want to ask you, what would be your advice to the Ukrainian government, to Ukrainian intelligence, to the military, and how to uh, push back against the threat of Russia? I mean, look, uh, all threats are hypothetical. So the way to push back against the threat of Russia I'm sorry, if I understood you correctly, you mean specifically in Ukraine or in general? Yeah, and specifically in Ukraine. Well, boy, that's a tough question because many people uh, think that the only way to push back against the threat of Russia is to, um, is to empower Ukraine to defend itself and protect itself. The question is, uh, what's the right way to do that? But for sure, the United States from its side could enable the Ukrainians to defend themselves. Probably he, they should do more to do that, do more to enable the Ukrainians. And uh, the U.S. and other Europeans have to continue to maintain their position that what's occurring in, uh, in uh, eastern Ukraine is a terrible tragedy. It's essentially a mass murder. Uh, it's uh, unlawfulness on, on an unseen scale in Europe. It's, it's completely unacceptable. It's, it's chaos. And it's fomented by business interests. I mean, I'm sure more uh, arms producers are promoting the war in Ukraine. Russian arms producers are probably the biggest sponsors of the war in Ukraine. Uh, the intelligence services are capturing Ukrainian businesses and, and, and using them to line their pockets. I mean, it's almost impossible to say that Mr. Putin actually has control of what's going on there. I think the guys that work for him have control of what's going on there, and they're just doing it to make themselves wealthy. So it's not really a Russian foreign policy. It's more like uh, the wild, wild west or the wild, wild east, unfortunately, for Ukraine. So how you get that under control state to state, I, I don't really know. It's a very difficult situation because it's, it's absolute. it's a stateless, chaotic environment. So do you think that... That's interesting. So Putin, the Kremlin, may not have as much control. Do you think that's on both sides, on the Ukrainian side and the Russian side, that you have arms dealers, oligarchs, people making a lot of money from this who are really controlling it? Well, to a large extent, I think both the Ukrainian and the Russian side are unable to control the actions on a day-to-day -day basis of the people involved in this conflict. Yes, absolutely. What, going back to U.S. foreign policy, what could the Trump administration do to improve, uh, you know, its tactics, what it's doing in East Europe, especially with regard to NATO? Well, at the level of the the executive, uh, I'm sorry, at the level of um, President Trump's staff, Secretary Tillerson and, and General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, there's no improvement. Those two guys are superb experts. They are, are internationally savvy. Uh, Secretary Mattis is a brilliant, honest, hardworking man who will always do the right thing. I happen to believe that uh, Mr. Tillerson is the same. So I think they deserve our full confidence. What Mr. Trump himself has to do is overcome his uh, blunders, political blunders, his international blunders, his absolute inability to get along with the personally with the leaders of our uh, allied nations, uh, the guy has made it almost impossible for the people working for him to achieve their results. I mean, I think they essentially have to ignore what he's said or done because he, he hasn't said or done the right thing uh, often at all. I want to ask you actually about the sanctions that were imposed on Russia by the EU and the U.S. I know a lot of Russians travel 
to the Baltic states, to Latvia. Are you noticing an effect on the, the economy in Latvia from the sanctions that were imposed on Russia? Uh, many people felt that there was an effect when they were when they were first imposed. It turned out not to be true. It was kind of, uh, you know, the average person's uh, assumption. The oil drop in oil price was the largest effect. Remember, these sanctions targeted uh, arms companies. They targeted banks. They didn't target economic sanct uh, sectors like Russia, for example. What they did was a blanket uh, sanction against the. Uh, Western fruit food products. So those sanctions in part impacted the average working person in Europe, as well as the average Russian citizen. Those were poorly thought out, uh, uh, kind of, let's say, retributions that impacted the everyday person. The Western sanctions against Russia targeted specific companies which were involved in Ukraine. They didn't target Russian manufacturers of anything other than uh, weapons. And they only targeted barely the gas and oil industry, and they targeted some banks which were financing uh, these kind of criminal activities in Ukraine. So for anyone to believe that those sanctions impacted the economy of Russia is foolish. And for anyone to believe that the countries which depend on the Russian economy were impacted by the sanctions is also foolish. Uh, Russian purchasers didn't lose their buying power the ruble crashed. Uh, that wasn't because of the sanctions. That was because of the fall in oil and the fact that the Russian economy is single track on oil. And now, a year later, you see that the Baltic economies are right back on track. And there's really no difference because, you know, the oil prices rise back up again. So the only people here who have suffered as a result of those sanctions were people who are laundering money or involved in the oil and gas sector. Uh, very fascinating. And my, my final question, though, I really want to ask you. You know, do you think that the uh, mobilization of NATO forces in Poland, in Romania, in Eastern Europe is the correct solution to countering Russia? It's part of the solution for sure, because, um, I mean, look, the, the, the Russian society and Russian people don't want conflict. Uh, I mean, they, they live and 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 have properties in Europe. They have family in America. They they go to school in Europe. I mean, Russian society. The last thing they want is a conflict with Europe. Uh, I believe. Of course, there's always some who want a conflict. Uh, so, the real question is how the leadership in Russia uh, manipulates the activities or the oh, I'm sorry, people's perceptions of the buildup in Europe by NATO. So my point is that. The buildup is necessary because our NATO allies have every right to feel threatened by the Russian incursion into Ukraine and the irresponsible action of the Kremlin leadership. But at the same time, the United States and NATO have to go out of the way to have a kind of open campaign for those Russians who are part of Western society, who live and work in Europe, who live and work in America, to understand that none of these activities are actually aimed at the nation or the people of Russia. These activities are named or targeted against the oligarchs, the business interests, the criminals involved in surrounding the Kremlin who use chaos and conflict and violence to achieve their further economic goals. Well, this has been a really fascinating and informative interview. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Hollihan. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Cheers. I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. I was speaking with David Hollihan. He is former Marine for over 21 years, the former U.S. defense attache to Latvia and the owner at Overbrook International in Riga, Latvia.